Well, gang, it is great to be together. If you are visitor guests, my name is Tom, and whether you are listening to this via our website, via the iTunes podcast, whether you're going to catch this on the north side of the street or you are here gathered now, it is great to be with you, and happy Thanksgiving to everyone who is here. You might not know this, but Jesus was a foodie. Did you know that? Jesus was a foodie before they even created the term foodie, right? And so he spent a lot of time around tables. And so we're jumping into week two of Life at the Table. We thought it'd be a good thing for us to do this as we all uh, prepare to head to our Thanksgiving table, looking at what Jesus did when he was around some of the tables that he was around that taught us both who he welcomed and invited to his table, what he said while he was there, and what he challenged them to do whenever they got up and left those tables. Well, today we come to a teaching from Jesus that speaks to our heart's deepest desire. And the desire is this, that we all want to have a life that counts. None of us want to be on our deathbed and think, I wasted it all. We all want to have a life that makes a difference. But we also want to have a life that has deep personal joy along the way, too. We want to make a difference, and we want to have joy. We want both of those together. But how exactly can that happen? Now, Jesus gave us the secret. He said that there is only one way that those two things, your life making a difference and having personal joy, can come together. There's only one way for that to happen, and we're going to consider that. But before we do, let's pray. So God, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you for a roof over our head. We thank you for a table that is set. We thank you for new mercies. We thank you for the next heartbeat. We thank you that when one day our heart stops beating, there'll be another day when it begins to beat again because of what you've done to beat back death. And so God, we ask now, would you open our minds and our hearts Overcome our suspicion and skepticism about your word. Instead, would we welcome it into our lives, even now? And God, would it then grow in us and grow from us to produce all the good that you desire? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, go ahead and grab your bulletin that you got hopefully on your way in. If you're watching online, you can click the tab and you'll see the notes that are there for you as well. You'll see the teaching notes that are there that you can fill out throughout our time together, as well as the scriptures that we will be looking at as we go. Well, let me give you the scene. Here's the scene. Jesus is now seated around a table with his disciples and he's sharing a meal. Not everyone who started the meal at the table is still seated with Jesus around the table. In fact, there's an empty chair at the table now. See, Judas was at the table, but now he's made the decision to get up and leave the table. You know, it's a hard reality that not everyone who comes to the table stays at the table with Jesus. The decision to do life at the table is not a decision that we make just one time in our life, but it is a decision that we are invited to make every single day. In fact, every single moment we're invited to make the decision to stay with them. Starting from that table, Jesus then takes the remaining 11 disciples outside to a vineyard to teach them about the one thing that you and I must do if we want to have both a purposeful life as well as a joyful life combined together. Here's Jesus' words in John chapter 15, verse 1 and onward. It says this, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you abide in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not abide in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. 
I have loved you even as my Father has loved me. Abide in my love. When you obey my commandments, you abide in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Now, there's a lot of good news in this passage, but if you heard it clearly, there's also a very clear warning in this passage. The warning is this, is that your choice of what you do with your life really matters. God will honor for eternity the kind of person that you choose to become in life. So if we choose to reject God's good plan for our life, to bear abundant, lasting fruit, our lives will then begin to shrivel up and become self-focused and self-concerned all the time. Eventually, if you continue to reject God's good, clear purpose for our lives, then it is indeed, Jesus is saying, true that one day you can be separated from Christ and from His goodness forever. Your choice matters. God's grace is available now, but make no mistake, God's grace will not be available forever. There is a season that we are in for us to say yes to Jesus. Now, we want our lives to count. We want them to have purpose. We don't want them to be wasted, and we want to be joyful. But what does God want for our lives? Now, here's the good news. God wants the exact same thing for our lives. That's what this passage just told us. In fact, this innate desire that we have is actually implanted in us by God himself. As Philippians 2.13 says to us, God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. He's giving you both first the desire, but then also the ability. He doesn't give you the desire without the ability to accomplish what pleases him. Now, fruit, people sometimes wonder, well, what, what is Jesus talking about? What type of fruit is he talking about in this passage? In this passage, fruit is an image of the good results that come from a life of someone who abides in Jesus. Good results, meaning bringing benefit to the lives of others around you, as well as advancing the work of God in the world around us. And these good works, as well as advancing God's good will in the, in the world around us, are the overflow of the good work that God first does inside of us. That good fruit that he wants to give us of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. In fact, we just read that Jesus says, apart from him, we can do nothing. Now, what is he talking about there? We can all go and do various things, but really what he's saying is, apart from me, you can do nothing that's really going to count, that's really going to have a lasting value throughout eternity. Jesus' promises in this passage are ridiculously great. When you look at them, they take away a lot of the variables, a lot of the insecurity that we might feel about our lives. Notice it doesn't say this. It doesn't say, if you abide in me, you might be cleaned. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say you could bear fruit. It doesn't say your prayer life may grow in power. It doesn't say you may be able to squeeze out a few grapes. It doesn't say that. It says you will be cleansed if you abide in me. It says you will bear fruit. But then it goes on and says, you will not only bear fruit, you will bear much fruit. And then he goes on and says, you will bear much fruit that is lasting fruit. He says that your prayer life will have power. And oh, by the way, all of that is going to happen. And you're also going to get a joy that you won't be able to contain. But all of those promises that I've just mentioned from Jesus are conditional. They hinge on one thing. All of them hinge on if you abide in Christ, it is within your power to abide in Christ. God is not asking you to do something that is impossible. So there's a great hope here because what Jesus is telling us as we come to this harvest weekend is that if we abide in Christ, God has appointed work for each one of us to do a unique kingdom contribution that he has uniquely created you to do that he's uniquely determined the times and places in which you live, that he's uniquely given you certain spiritual gifts and abilities, and all of that appointed work will result in personal joy and lasting and abundant fruit if we abide in Christ. 
So then the question for this weekend is this, how do we abide in Christ? This passage gives us four ways we abide in Christ. The first way is this, to abide in Christ, you need to put in, put in. Put in what? You need to put in God's word into your heart and mind. If you want to have personal overflowing joy and lasting abundant fruit coming from your life, you must constantly have a steady diet of God's word. You must memorize it. You must let it uh, set up shop in your heart and your mind. You have to let it dwell with you for a while. You have to let it germinate in your heart and soul for a little bit. You have to let it be like a seed that's in your heart that's going to take a little bit of time to grow. And from that, good will begin to be produced. In fact, in your bulletin, I italicized the words uh, that Jesus spoke from verses 4 and 5. Jesus didn't italicize those words, by the way, for you. I did that, right? And the reason I did that is I want to challenge you to memorize those two verses this week before you come to your Thanksgiving table. Just two verses. You can do it. God will help you. Memorize those two verses as a way for you to put God's word into your mind and into your heart. As Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Well, for the words to be remaining in you, you have to put God's word in. Let me give you an example. From January to March of this year, for whatever reasons, God kept bringing me to Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. I didn't plan it. I wasn't looking for it. At the time, I wasn't even reading Isaiah in my devotional reading. But over and over again, that particular verse kept coming up. I remember sitting in my sister's house. It was uh, January 1st, and I opened up the devotional I was reading, and it was Isaiah 50, verse 4. I remember a week later, somebody mentioned Isaiah verse 50, verse 4 to me. <clears throat> at one point, uh, a month later, I was at home, and I was uh, getting ready to go to bed, and I had my Bible, and I flopped it on the bed, and it kind of fell open, and it fell open to Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, right? Now, here's the first part of that verse. It says, the, Lord ha- the sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom <clears throat> to know the word that sustains the weary. And so then, that particular phrase, to know a word that sustains the weary, it just, something about it, it just got in my heart. And God began to break my heart for people who are just weary, And it just dwelled in my heart. And I began to ask God, God, what would you want me to do? What word would you want to give me to sustain the weary? And from that came the genesis of our last whole series called Anxious for Nothing. That's how we ended up doing Anxious for Nothing. Because I felt like the Lord was saying that many of our people struggle with anxiety and worry. And that God wanted to sustain us with a word. In fact, we had 3,000 people here on average uh, on the weekends, but we also had another 1,000 people, almost almost another 1,000, watching every weekend online just in that series alone. In fact, I have churches, even this week, another church contacted me and said, I heard from some people who heard the series, and I want to get your notes so that we can do the series in our church as well. And so God is just rippling this out, right? It's just rippling out from putting God's word into my heart. Now, God maybe isn't giving you Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 as the word that he's speaking to you, but he has a word that he wants to put into your heart. He has a word that he wants you to know, and he wants you to dwell on it, and he wants you to allow it to linger in you so that it will bear fruit. In fact, so many of you were so encouraging, you would come up to me and you would say to me things like, you know, that series, it helped me so much. In fact, right before the service, I had somebody seated right over here say, hey, I just want you to know how much that series helped me so much. And each time somebody did that, I heard the Spirit of God just whisper to me, this is the good fruit of letting my word from Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 dwell in your heart and dwell in your mind. You need to keep putting God's word in your heart. Dwell with it. Let it challenge you. Let it rebuke you. Let it comfort you. Let it instruct you. Let it mold you. And let me tell you this, that if you think, well, you know, I want to move on from God's word. I don't really believe God's word anymore. Well, if you don't believe God's word, you're going to believe someone else's word. 
We all listen to someone's word. You might as well pick God's word because God's word is the one that's infallible to begin with anyways. It's the one that comes to give you life. It's the one that comes to give you hope. And it's the one that came as a baby in the manger at Christmas. Put God's word into your heart. And when you do that, it will eventually change what you do. And you will bear good fruit. Good fruit will come from you as you abide in Christ, putting God's good word, put it in your heart. The second thing to abide in Christ, first is put in. The second is to clean up. Jesus' words can seem a little bit weird here in most English translations. Most say something like this in uh, verse 2. It says, well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it'll be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. And when you read that in English, it's like, that's weird, Jesus. You're mixing metaphors. You need to go back to rhetoric class. Like, you're talking about gardening, and then all of a sudden you're talking about doing dishes. Like, those are two different kind of things. What are you doing? What does pruning have to do with cleanness? Well, it seems like two different things, but that's not actually the case in the original language. In fact, the Greek for he prunes also means he cleans. It means both of those things together. And so in the original, it says that God cathare you, and now you are catharoi. So you can hear that the root word is the same. The only difference is the ending. And the difference on the ending there shows you that one is a verb about what God does, and then one is an adjective of who you become as a result of what God did for you. It's the same root word. We come to that prune part first, and then we're going to focus on the cleansing part. When a new branch forms on a a vine, on a grapevine, its tendency due to gravity is to trail down along the ground. But it can't bear fruit there because the fruit actually hangs down off of the branch. So the branch has to be higher off the ground in order for the, the fruit to grow down underneath it. But whenever it begins to trail down on the ground, its leaves get kind of coated in the mud of the vineyard and and gets wet, and when it rains, the ground makes it muddy, and then the branch and the leaves that are associated with the branch begin to get mildewed. And so what a vine dresser will do, they do this all over California, what they will do is they will go through and they will look for branches that are trailing down onto the ground. They'll look for leaves that are trailing down onto the ground. And they take a bucket of water with them and they wash the leaves. They wash the mud off the leaves and the mildew. And then what they do is they actually either wrap it around the trellis or they'll sometimes tie it up around the trellis so that it can be up out of the mud. So they cleanse it. They lift it up out of the mud so that it can then begin to bear fruit. That's how fruit begins to form. Pretty soon then, they're thriving. For a Christian, sin is like the dirt covering the grape leaves of our lives. You get down in the mud long enough, and the air can't get down there to cleanse it out, and the mildew starts to build up in your life, and the light can't get there, and so then no fruit develops. But when you abide with Christ, and his word abides in you, it begins to cleanse your life as you obey it. As you allow his word to be in your life, it begins to point out things that begin to be like, you know, I'm not comfortable with that anymore. I used to do that all the time, but I don't want to do that anymore. That's God beginning to clean you out. God is using his word. He's the one doing the cleaning. He's the one doing the cathare so that you can become catharoi, so that you can become cleansed. He lifts you out of the muck and mire so that you begin to bear fruit. So how do you know then if you're abiding in Christ? Because we don't want to be delusional about this. One way is that if you are a follower of Jesus and you've been following him for, let's say, at least six months, you should be able to look back over your life and see at least a few things that are different because of the fact you've made a decision to follow Jesus. There should be a few things in your life that you've let God clean up some areas of your life and you are different because you let God's word be the highest word in your heart and mind. You let God's word be the word that began to clean you up. And when God's word comes to clean you up, he doesn't do it out of judgment or anger. He does it out of love because he wants you to be cleansed and he also wants you to begin to bear fruit. So if you want to abide, you have to put God's word in. And when you put God's word into your life, it will begin to clean you up from the inside out. And you should be able to see that over a period of time. 
The third thing about abiding is this. First is put in. Second is clean up. The third is to clear out. Cathare, that word prune, or also can be translated he cleans, it means he cleans, but it also means he cleans in a certain way, more associated with him clearing something out of your life. And so when Jesus says that my father is the vine dresser, what he's talking about when he says he cleans there, it's not only that he washes the leaves, but he also clears out the superfluous growth, the abundance of growth from a plant that isn't actually producing fruit. When I lived in Pittsburgh, I had a friend, uh, his name is Jerry, and he had a wild grapevine in his yard that he wanted to cultivate to bear fruit that we could use. And so he did a little bit of research and he came across this gardening report. And here's what the gardening report said. It said this, left to itself, a great plant will always favor more growth of leaves over more growth of grapes. The result, from a distance, it will appear to have luxurious growth and it will seem like an impressive achievement. But up close, it will be an underwhelming harvest because the grape's tendency is to grow so vigorously that a lot of wood must be cut away each year. Grapevines can become so dense that the sun cannot reach the area where the fruit should be forming underneath the leaves. And so the recommendation was that you needed to clear out some of the leaves to allow for space for the fruit to begin to form. And that without a periodic cleaning out, a periodic clearing out of those leaves, that you wouldn't get the harvest that you really wanted to have. God knows that with us as well, without a periodic clearing out of all of the things that we think are so urgent in our life that result in nothing, without a periodic clearing out of them, you will only reach a fraction of your kingdom potential. Where is God inviting you to do some clearing out? Some things that are not resulting in the abundant fruit that God has ordained for you to produce. Where is God asking you to clear out some time so that you can spend some time with a neighbor who needs you? To clear out some time from the amount of time that you spend online so that you can host a life group in your home. To clear out some time so that you can speak up for the widow, the orphaner, the foreigner among us. To clear out a little bit of time so that you can share faith with a coworker. In fact, this weekend we're celebrating the sacrament of baptism. We have 18 people getting baptized across all the life of our church. And one of the things that I love about the stories that we're going to be hearing throughout this weekend is the variety of things that God uses. In fact, one person's story was because a client shared with them about faith. God used one of their clients to help them. And I thought, you know, that client could have just been, you know what, I, I'm not about God's work right now. I'm busy. I got things going on. But they cleared out a little bit of time to share faith. And because of that, someone's getting baptized this weekend. Some things God asks you to do, you can't just squeeze them into your schedule. You have to clear out to create space for the fruit to be born. Case in point, three years ago, I wrote a book, and that came out, and then my publisher asked me to write another book, and I just tried to fit it in. For three years, I tried to fit in writing a book kind of on the margins of my time. In fact, I actually said to them, I tell you what, I, I can't do it, so take your advance royalties back, and we'll just, you know, I, I can't do it, and they said, no, 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 we really want you to write this book, and I literally, I would say to my wife, like, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time, and so finally, she said to me this summer, she said, Tom, you're just going to have to say no to a bunch of really good things so that you can say yes to what God is asking you to do. And so this summer, I did that. And so now the book is in process, and it's going to come out in the summer of 2019. The next book's going to come out. And here's the thing about it, is that there are so many other things that I thought were more urgent for three years. I just thought, well, God wants me to do this, and I'll get to it eventually, but i got a million other things going on. And I want to say to some of us, you're like me. You need to hear that just because something is more urgent in your life does not mean it will be more fruitful in your life. There are some things that you feel like, it's just urgent, I just got to be everywhere all the time, and then slowly what will happen is you'll run out of time 
to do what God is asking you to do. And then I had this kind of surprising delight where in May, it's actually going to be done in May, in May of this upcoming year, 3,200 pastors are going to receive a copy of it at a conference that they're going to be at. Now, that all came out of the fact that my wife said to me, no, really, you got to clear out some time and do what God is asking you to do. I don't know what will happen in your life. I don't know how you'll be delighted about what God will want to do once you begin to clear out the things that he's saying. I'm not asking you to do that. Don't be so focused on the urgent. Be focused on the fruitful. You need to clear out some of the things in your life to allow the fruit that God wants to produce through you begin to grow. My guess is that all of us can think of some things where we look back. In fact, do this exercise if you've never done it. Google is so great because they keep all of your emails for eternity. And so you can like look back, right, at your emails. And it's amazing if you go back like two or three years. I did this about two months ago. And I just read some random emails from like two or three years ago. And things that I thought were really important back then, like they don't matter at all now. Things that I thought were like super urgent to get done, like they don't really matter at all now. And so it makes me now think, okay, God, let me not waste my life on just growing a bunch of leaves. I want to grow fruit for you. I want to clear out what you want me to clear out to be focused in on what you want me to be focused in on because just because something is urgent doesn't mean that it's fruitful. And God will clear out some things in your life. He'll do that so that you can focus in on what really matters for his kingdom. The fourth way that we abide is that we need to stay under. God wants you to put in God's word, and then as you put God's word in, it will begin to clean up your life, and it will also begin to clear out your life of some things that are just sucking away time that maybe aren't very productive and fruitful for his kingdom. And why is he doing that? He's doing that because he loves you, because he wants you to have a lasting, fruitful life, and he also wants you to have personal joy as a result of it. So part of that is staying under Christ's love. In fact, the word abide, if you break it down in the original, it means to remain or to stay under as in a dwelling or a lodging place. So think of it like a home that you're living in. You want to stay under or you want to dwell in God's love wherever you go. You want to stay in Christ's love. In fact, Jesus says it this way in John 15 verse 9, I have loved you even as my Father has loved me. Abide in my love. Dwell in my love. Hang out in my love. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you abide in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and abide in His love. When I abide, I obey. Why? Because I trust God's love for me. And because I trust that He loves me, I trust that His commandments then are not bad for me. They're actually good for me. They're a sign of God's love made actionable. That's what his commandments are. And so when I don't obey, it creates a big flashing warning sign that I am not abiding in Christ's love. Now you might be thinking, what, are you telling me that God only loves me if I obey him? What's up with that? No, that's not what I said. And that's not what the scriptures say here either. God loves you regardless of whether or not you obey him. But think of it this way. I have three children. I love each of my children. I'm doing my very best to show them that I love them and build enough trust with them that as they grow to become adults, they will trust the love that I have for them. And as they become adults, I'm hoping that that trust that they have of my love for them will be a foundation that if they would choose to make a choice that I would say, look, that's not the best according to God's word, like, don't do that. They would know that I'm saying that because of love, not because of control, but because of love, because I want the very best for them in their life. I love them, though, regardless of whether or not they trust me enough to obey them. But here's where people get a little bit kind of sideways. They begin to think like this. They think, well, if God really loves me, then I should be able to make whatever choices I want, and then God should protect me from my choices. Now, that's not how it works. My love for my kids means that I allow them to have free will, but it also means that I'm not able to then protect them from the choices 
that they make, the results of the choices they make. We might think, well, you know, well then maybe if God really loves me, what he should do is that he should make me abide, even against my will. God, I don't want to abide, but if you really love me, you would make me abide. We call that hostage taking. And so, we, you know, God doesn't do that, and we don't want to do that, right? I'm not going to do that with my children as they get older. I'm not going to take them hostage and say, you must abide and stay here with me. No, they have a free will. God's given you a free will as well. No rightful parent would hold their adult child hostage against their will. God loves you, but God loves you enough to let you choose to break his heart. He loves you enough to let you make that choice. On the flip side, your obedience is a sign of whether you really believe God loves you and knows what's best for your life. And so when we abide, we obey. And when we obey, fruit is produced, but not just a little fruit, abundant fruit and lasting fruit. Someone might say to me, well, Tom, I want to have a life that has lasting, abundant fruit, but I don't really want to abide in Christ. And Jesus' answer to you is this, that's not an option. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Jesus tells us the heart of this teaching is for us to have joy. In verse 11, he says this, I've told you these things so that you might be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And I can tell you that's been my experience. I can't control everything that happens around me in life, and neither can you. I can't control what the stock market does. I can't control what the economy does. I can't control the state of the nation. I can't control what you do. But here's what I can do. I can abide in Christ. God has given me both the desire and he's also given me the power to do that. And for many of you, you're just like that as well. God has given you the desire and he's also given you the power to do that. So don't tell yourself, well, I can't abide in Christ. Yes, you can. If you tell yourself, I can't abide in Christ, you're actually directly contradicting what Jesus just said in John 15. This passage is not about whether or not you are able to abide in Christ. It is about whether or not you choose to abide in Christ. God is already at work in you, giving you the desire and giving you now the power to do that. But then you have to make a choice. Now, maybe others of you, you think, well, I don't, I don't yet have that desire. I don't really have the desire to, to abide with him. But if you want that, then ask him for it. The step for you might be as simple as saying, God, I want you to begin to awaken within me a desire to discover all the good that you have in store for me as I put your word into my life, as I let you clean up my life from it, as I let you clear out the things that aren't really priorities in my life, shouldn't be priorities in my life. As I let you do that and I stay under your love, give me the desire to do that. And as you pray that, God will answer that prayer. That starts with saying yes to Jesus for the very first time. But saying yes to Jesus isn't a one-time deal. It's an ongoing thing that we do day after day after day. Each time we say a yes to Jesus, we're abiding him, abiding in him in a fresh way. So then we put in God's word and God's word begins to clean up our lives and it begins to clear out the things that don't matter as much and we begin to stay under God's love. And when we do that, your life will be marked not just by fruit, but by abundant fruit. And not just by abundant fruit, but lasting abundant fruit. And not just lasting abundant fruit, but also personal joy. And not just lasting abundant fruit, and personal joy, but also communal joy. Because remember, he gave this teaching to his disciples, to a community of people, that they'd have joy together, that they would thank God for the good works and faith that have been shared together among them. A promise of your life bearing lasting, abundant fruit with personal and communal joy in the presence of God who loves us. If that's not a reason to give thanks, then I don't know what is. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you. I thank you for giving me the desire and the power to do what pleases you. Maybe right now you, you think, I, I, I don't have that desire. You can ask for it. God, I want that desire. Ask him. Others of you, you just need to tell yourself, God tells me that I have 
the power to abide in Him. So I need to stop telling myself, I don't. He's given me the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. And so now, God, would you make it, for all who desire it, make us wise to choose each day this week, each day this year, to abide in Christ. One day at a time, one yes at a time. Your good word, your good will, your good ways all of our days. Thank you for making this possible. Only in Jesus we pray. Amen.